so, so no. welcome to this session in which we um, are discussing trust in science yes. with Peter Doherty and Stephen Chu, both of them Nobel laureates, as you know, and you'll have met them already today. Now, um, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll run the conversation between us for a while, and then I will come out to the audience for questions as well, which we shall listen to through these also. So, um, trust in science. Surveys by um, people like the Pew Trust, Charitable Trust, or Ipsos Mori in the UK tell us that actually scientists are among a very trusted group of people, and trust in scientists is increasing. And we, as scientists, know that scientists are trustworthy people. But there is also there are also clear cases where trust in science seems to be evaporating. So first of all, let me just start by saying, do you think that people do have trust in science? Steve? I think, in general, yes, they do have a trust in science. Uh, but it's a strange kind of trust because um, it's a trust because we see that it's not a strange kind of trust. It makes perfect sense. Uh, uh, we have no extra grind. Uh, most of us don't aren't making money on this. There's no financial entanglements. Um, but yet, in that same Pew uh, survey, there is a strange thing growing. There's a growing uncertainty about vaccines, uh, that vaccines might not be good for you, uh, and yet it, vaccines have had a profound influence on human health. Mm. Um, there is a disconnect between what scientists think, what the public thinks, and what some other uh, embedded industries think about climate change. And so they actually break down and go through this list. And some of these attack points are genetically modified crops. Again, there's a fraction of very vo vocal, loud people who say that this is inherently dangerous and they try to stoke fear and suspicion about that. And yet, uh, the thing about genetically modified crops is if used in the right way, you know, Monsanto was very tone deaf, um, but if used in the right way, it can actually feed many more people, keep developing people's farms functioning in a way that could feed people with less pesticides, less herbicides, and so on. Hmm. And so, again, you know, th there are these conflicts, and I think things like that are growing. Hmm. Yes, it's, it's interesting, the vaccines, you guys particularly, in vaccines, the, the distrust of vaccines is interesting because it goes right across the spectrum in different ways from left to right. Uh, you, a, a lot of the uh, rejection of vaccines that we see for instance, in Australia, would, would be, on the one hand, you've got very well-to-do uh, women, particularly, who reject vaccination for various types of reasons to do with personal empowerment, and, and, uh, and, uh, and they may believe some of the propaganda around the uh, MMR vaccine and so forth, even though that's been so rigorously refuted by some, so many scientific studies. And on the other hand, you'll have the sort of alternative lifestyle community that will, will, will reject the vaccine uh, approach. Um, Though much of actually the failure to uptake vaccines is simply disorganisation <laughs> and, uh, yes. and, and not, being, not getting around to it. Th then, but on the, on the GM side, it, it really polarises on what one thinks is the left of, of the political spectrum. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it was very much stirred up by Monsanto yes. and the way they went about it and the suspicion that Monsanto is trying to take over the world's seed supply mm. and they're going to control farmers and they're going to dictate. And, and they have dictated in some senses, which have really been quite obnoxious. But then there's the great advantages of, of, of for instance, trying to make uh, drought resistance and grains and so forth using GM approaches and of course the the saffron rice that uh, uh, was developed by uh, by at ETH in Zurich which could have saved many many lives in uh, the Philippines and so forth but because of the very strong activity by Greenpeace which is in many ways a quite admirable organization uh, th there's been a rejection of that yeah. so so it's it, it's there's nothing it's not that rejection of science is some sort of hard right position or hard left position. It yeah. goes, goes right across. Uh, just, uh, we'll come to GMOs in a second maybe, but just you're an immunologist, so sticking with the, the vaccine issue. Um, it's, it's odd in a way that people do trust in science for many of their health decisions. They, they constantly want to know whether eating this will make them less likely to get cancer or whatever. And yet on vaccines, 
rather specifically, they s people seem to be scared of the science or or, not, or distrustful of the science. Well, well, I mean, what what are you doing with the vaccine? I mean, you're taking a child, a small child, and you're injecting the child with something. And firstly, firstly, parents can find that very distressing. Secondly, uh, a child who's perfectly happy, you take them along, you inject them with the vaccine, uh, they, they'll be grumpy, <laughs> quite possibly, because a vaccine is causing an immune response. An immune response actually causes all sorts of chemicals to be released that make you feel rather dull and not very happy. And mm -hmm. in a small child, you can have a whiny, whingy child. Then the, the other factor is, of course, if something happens to that child within the next month or two, people will, will blame it on the vaccine. And, and, and the, there are issues, too, where vaccines can, can actually do harm. I mean, it's a probability relative risk equation. And, and that's something that does not necessarily permeate society. The idea that uh, if, you, if you vaccinate against a particular infection that the child won't get it, but, but then if you get this false correlation with something like the MMR story, then, mm. then yeah. uh, people get scared off. And, and there's a very powerful constituency. I, a friend of mine is, is, is a guy called Paul Offit. Who's, who's a pediatric infectious disease guy, developed the, the rotavirus vaccine. That, of course, is a big negative in the vaccine thing because Offit just wants to make profit, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. Is, couldn't be further from his thought. He, he, he tried to write a very, very clear explanatory book. He's written a number of books on, on the MMR story, the measles, mumps, rubella, this story that it causes autism. And he, and he went through it in a very systematic and, and very balanced way and and, and as a result of that, he gets death threats. He won't go on national television in the United States because he, here he is, a middle-aged guy in a national television format who's, who, who's operating in the context of science. He's up against some very attractive woman who's appealing to emotional instincts and, and of course, is able to go anywhere she wants with the argument. So I'm not trying to be sexist about this, but th this is, it, it just doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Steve, yeah. well, just to add to that, um, what was happening was uh, there was a few c cases of a correlation where when you get this measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, you begin to, be, you're at an age where autism is beginning to be diagnosed. And that has convinced several mothers that absolutely was cause of the autism. And there is no real correlation, and yet it spread well, over the internet like crazy. Well, well when, whenever there's an issue with a vaccine, uh, then it's taken extremely seriously yes. because this is something you're injecting into children. So we had a, an, an instance in Australia, for instance, where a, a formulation of the influenza vaccine, and influenza vaccines are problematic at various levels. I work in the influenza area. But this influenza vaccine was actually causing uh, a fever in some small children, and when children, small children get fever, they go into febrile convulsions. And at least one child was severely damaged by this. So that vaccine was just not acceptable. But there was no reason to think it would do that. I mean, the flu vaccines are made yeah. every year and all the rest of it. So it was an aberration. The vaccine was, vaccination was stopped very quickly. But, but so there are some instances like sure. that. The measles, mumps, rubella story is based on a very bad paper that was published, unfortunately, in The Lancet, uh, which is a leading scientific journal. It should never have been published. Very limited number of cases. It turns out later they were selected in very ways which are quite unethical and but what the guy who was the key to the study was saying not to say saying it's not a problem to vaccinate against measles mumps and rubella what's a problem is to combine the three hmm. and so he wasn't trying to say don't vaccinate he was saying don't use this vaccine and and that's sort of sort of evolved into uh, the idea that uh, vaccination is dangerous I think one of the first things I'm, I was told uh, where, by, uh, um, I think it was Francis Collins, one of the first things he was asked by President Trump is what are you going to do about vaccines and autism? So, you know, so it's, 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 in, the, it's in Trump world. So is it, what is it, yeah. the public psyche? Let's, yeah. let's, let's pan out a bit and talk about bad papers because that's also something perhaps that is undermining trust in science. There is a feeling that there is um, scientific misconduct out there and that um, people are fraudulently publishing papers, or at least um, bad papers are being published. Of course, it's a very small number, but when you have things like retraction watch going on, that sort of highlights this to the public. Do you think there's a 
problem with scientific misconduct or? Uh, l let's go with bad papers. First. Let's start with bad papers. Yeah. Um, there are a, lot, are a lot of bad papers um, <laughs> in the sense that um, so you to publish um, that uh, you're maybe not as careful about all the controls you have to do. Hmm. And the pressure to publish is mounting, mounting, mounting. And so there are many things, especially in the bio, I'm you know, coming from physics, which you know, there's a theoretical basis and there are other things you can do. And when I started going in biology 25, 30 years ago, in the early 90s, that long ago, I heard the expression, in my hands, this is what we get. That's not science. <laughs> You're supposed to be publishing something that anyone can reproduce. And and so so this is one of the issues, and so there's a lot of things. Uh, so I think scientists have to take a, a higher responsibility. The number of purposely fraudulent things is very small, but there is this other thing that is encroaching. So I irreproducibility of papers is becoming in yes. biology a huge problem. Yes, it, um, has become has in, become in biomedicine. Yes, yeah, yes, it exactly. Is. Uh, and 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 part of it is the complexity of these systems. Uh, I think physics. Looking at it, physics is an outsider. I, I, I think physicists, on the whole, are pretty straight. I mean, physicists are trained as scientists. They're, they're very bright people. Uh, they're the brightest <laughs> people on Earth. As any phys I mean, Alfred Nobel thought the physicists were the smartest people on Earth. That's why they're, they're the people who sit on the stage first. There's, there's the physicists, then the chemists, then the medico, and then the, and then the literature guy, uh, person, and then the, the economists who sort of bought their way into the Nobel Prize later. And, um, <laughs> But, I don't know whether we're going to survive this 45 minutes. <laughs> but basically, basically, you know, so, but, but physics, I mean, there is a major, there are cases of major fraud in physics, and Stephen's very familiar with this because you, some of you may have read the book Plastic Fantastic, mm -hmm. uh, which was about a major fraud at the Bell Lab. And, yes. And for various reasons, people weren't watching the store. And, and yes. this happened. This guy was just faking. In biomedicine, we do have people who are faking. We, we've had some instances where people have made up data, and sometimes they got away with it because what they made up actually later turned out to be true. Uh, and, and, in, and in several cases where that's happened, the people who've exposed them are the young people in their labs because they're dedicated to the idea that they're probing truth, and here they find the guy they're working for is, is, is a professional liar. And, mm. and so that, that has been a factor. But the, but the other more disturbing factor is that with some of the enormously complex studies that are being done, particularly in molecular science, th there's an enormous difficulty in repeating them. Mm. And that is really problematic. And, uh, and I, I personally, uh, m my personal approach has always been you, you, you check and you check and then you always get into some what we call an in vivo system, which is either a lab mouse or a human being and check it in, in, a, in a real world. But a lot of the science is not checked in that way. All sorts of things can go wrong in science that's done with, say, cancer cell lines. I mean, if a cancer cell line gets infected with mycoplasma, for instance, and... Often people are not as careful as checking it that. It can give you totally erroneous results. So, well, yeah. so it is a concern. But the point about biomedical science is it's moving forward at an incredible rate to actually find solutions. We are getting incredible solutions to real disease problems very fast. But, yeah, yeah. Tr true. But, yeah. but I mean, St Steve, people will know you as a physicist. They may not know that you also have now a foot in the camp of biomedicine that you hold chairs in both, um, uh, or in uh, molecular... Uh, yes, I'm in half in the medical school. Yes. Half in the medical school, yeah. So, uh, does, do you worry very much about this growing problem of irre irreproducibility, that it will in some way undermine trust in science? Because although I don't think the biomedical community have quite sorted out why, things yeah. are so difficult to reproduce. Well, I think uh, Peter said it very concisely. It's really complicated. Okay. And, and, but, but there's something else. Um, in my lab, uh, if a graduate student postdoc does something, the first standard is they have to repeat it. In my lab, someone else in my lab has to repeat it. Yeah. That standard is not followed in every lab. And so this is something, and you want it to be more bulletproof. When you publish a paper and a protocol, you want it passed on to at least one more other person. I remember when I was first doing biophysics, optical tweezers, gluing little polysenes here to DNA, and you can whip around, and I, I was talking about it for two years. My colleagues asked me, have you published this yet? I said, no, not yet. Well, why not? I said, it only works half the time. Mm -hmm. 
half the time for two years? You got to be kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Steve got the Nobel Prize the same year as a, as a neuroscientist called Stan Prusiner. And Stan Prusiner uh, uh, developed the prion hypothesis, the infectious protein idea that at the basis of what we call the spongiformis encephalopathies, or in, as, as a former neuropathologist, the spongy brain rots. You don't want to be diagnosed with one of those, I tell you. But um, there was, before Stan came to that thing, there was, a, there was a particular assay that was done that was showing some extremely possible positive results. And it was, it was called the PAM assay. Because the only person who could do it was a woman called Pam. <laughs> and we, Pam was flown all around the world. She went to different labs. Uh, they checked her out. And she could always do it. Nobody else ever did the assay. Was I, I saw a magician today. That was <laughs> with Pam. She was a perfectly straightforward and nice person. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, so uh, biology <laughs> is incredibly complex. It's, it's quite idiosyncratic. And, and what, part of the problem now is, I mean, when I started in biomedical science back in the 1960s, 70s, it, it, there were three or four of us on a research paper and we all understood what was going on. We knew the technology and we could make wonderful generalisations because we couldn't do the experiments. It was much more fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were behaving like theoretical physicists. Um, but, uh, no, that's not really true. And, and, um, um, but now, because of the enormous power of technology, much of which has actually come from the physicists and the engineers who have given us these wonderful instruments, and then from the uh, computational people who'd, who did the analyses, but because of that power of technology, every subfield has become much more complex and much more specialised. And when we do a study, say a cancer study or an infectious disease study, we may be involving so many different subspecialties in that analysis that nobody on that research paper is actually right across the whole thing. Hmm. It, it's not, just not possible to be right across it. Uh, uh, and so, I mean, trust is, is essential within science, actually. Just yeah. as an aside, when the, I remember watching the press conference from the LHC results, and I was amazed by how much agreement there was between people when they were looking at the results. And I asked a f theoretical physicist, um, how come everybody's in agreement? And he said, well, the thing about physics, experimental physics, is, it's so ex is, is that it's so expensive that we all have to agree before we do the experiment. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but is there a problem? I in physics, it seems to be that partly that the theoreticians are in, in many areas are leading the experimentalists. Uh, no, and not really. No. Uh, first, um, when there's a big announcement with the collaboration that spans several hundred institutions, not people, there the haggling is done before it goes to public press. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is some haggling. Uh, the uh, announcement of gravity waves, there were three months of virile paranoia to make sure that this wasn't an artifact, that they really wanted to check everything, you know, s really months. It was beginning to leak out in January, but they really held wraps in this. Um, in terms of theory versus experiment, absolutely true that the Higgs was predicted long before, um, and it was a confirmation. It was, a, in a certain sense, very disappointing because theory was right. And even the theorists don't wanted, they wanted a surprise. And every, every physicist, every scientist wants a surprise. And, and the biggest fear now with the Large Hadron Collider is so far, no surprises. And that is a real fear. Mm. Billions of dollars, no surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need to be told something we don't know so we can think of something. And so the theory, the sta so-called standard model has been too successful. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Interesting. Whereas in biomedicine, is it true that people, you know, that people are just putting things out very fast? There's, n there's well, because possibly too fast. I don't know. Well, because things are happening so fast, and and because the the possibilities are so enormous. I mean, for instance, when I started uh, back in the 1970s, when I was doing the work we won the Nobel Prize for, there were no, none of what we call cytokines or chemokines. I mean, I think the first one was interleukin-2. Now, now there, are, there are enormous numbers of them, and some of these molecules, which are produced during immune responses, 
have been found to have enormous therapeutic potential in various ways. We, for instance, we're getting a story now for colon cancer where an, a molecule, I think it's interleukin-11, I, I maybe may have the wrong number, there are so many of these things, is actually clearly promoting the growth of the cancer. Mm. So here you've got a molecule that's designed uh, to try and reject a pathogen, a virus, a bug or something, which when it gets into a cancer situation is actually helping the cancer grow. We, we've long suspected that much of that sort of thing is happening. But it looks as though if you can block that, you can actually s slow the progression of this particular cancer very, very dramatically. And, and uh, that's happened all across the board with various of these molecules, which are now, we know, uh, if you block them, you can decrease the, uh, the, the suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. There are other situations where you can massively drop back the relapses uh, in multiple sclerosis and so forth. This has all been happening very quickly and almost on an ad hoc basis. There's no enormous intellectual component to yeah. this. It's a matter of just going ahead and testing it and testing it properly. Yeah. But, yeah. but you shouldn't go, go away the impression is biology and medicine are racing ahead and physics is not. Um, I, I think if, and the scale of very large machines, very large budgets like high energy physics, large hydrogen collider, uh, gravity waves, absolutely takes uh, decades. If you look at other things, uh, nanotechnology, what's happening in electrochemistry, some of the things yeah. that I'm actually uh, actively involved in today, it's racing ahead just as fast. And so, so this is part of physics, physical chemistry, material science. Uh, very profound, deep understandings, the ability to make new materials that completely enable new biological probes Absolutely. to new batteries uh, is racing. And so it's a very exciting time to be alive. Yeah, we're look, we're, I mean, one of the big problems with drugs, of course, is drug delivery. Yes. And, and we're looking very much to the nanoscientists. So substantially chemists, I think, I mean, also physicists, and, and uh, to actually it's, it's a form of material science to try and get delivery systems that work infinitely better yeah. than yeah. the delivery systems yeah. we have. I mean, once you get into therapeutics, uh, th there's this sort of net nexus between physics, chemistry, and, and biology, mm -hmm. with, with us often on the sort of m rather the measurement end rather than the yeah. innovation end. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the last three years, I'm actually, I dare say, sadly, I'm learning chemistry. Uh, that'll, be a th <laughs> that'll be a third chair for you. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know uh, you know physics and biology. But I said some of the things I wanted to do in biology and in energy means I had to learn chemistry. And so okay, I'm going to have to learn chemistry, and it's been fun. Um, you know, my advisor was horrified that I was even using lasers to try to cool and trap atoms. He said you have to stick to the basic, fundamental, really important stuff. <laughs> and he would be even more horrified if I was becoming a chemist. Okay. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> well, you know, that's a, this is uh, the smartest people I know if they don't talk to chemists. <laughs> As a chemist, I'll just sit here and take it. And, <laughs> um, one more topic to discuss before we go to the audience. Um, the role of the media in trust in science. Uh, do you think that, it's a huge general generalization, but do you think the media are doing a good job in portraying science to the general public? Steve? No. Uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of the things uh, that's the driving force in the media is to sell copy. Uh, because uh, the print media, the televised media, all the media are competing with these bubble inter internet things where you only talk to your friends. And all friends talk to their friends, and they don't talk to others. And they wanted to compete. And so how do you compete? You actually present the other side, the alternative view. And they will search long and hard for some alternative view. And so, unfortunately, some very minority position uh, then almost gets elevated to the same position as as you know much more serious scientists and so that is very disturbing the other thing is the quality of scientific reporters the number of quality scientific reporters is diminishing and and that that's a problem yeah i mean particularly a problem in the print media where they're under enormous pressure because of online information uh, free information and so forth and and so that we've been losing a lot of a lot of our good science journalists but we also have media uh, very substantial media organizations for instance which will simply not report anything factual on climate change they will go to any alternative source and that uh, 
uh, I mean, Fox News, for instance, which will will simply in, anything serious they if they report it, they will trivialise it. And so we, we're getting a deliberate uh, dissembling in, in elements of the media. On the other hand, of course, we, we, we have sort of people who are professional uh, science communicators, the David Attenboroughs, the Brian Coxes and all the rest of it, who, who, who try to do the right thing and try to do a reasonably good job. And unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't really... I, th I think it often fails to get across to people the essence of science and how it actually works and what it does and what its, what its strengths yeah. and limitations are. It's, it often comes across as sort of gee whizzes and this wonderful stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. but the other thing about, uh, yeah. in, you know, one side you say, well, we reported the story and that's it. And uh, the other side just wants to repeat over and over and over again because, as I said this morning, you know, um, uh, I may not have said it in public, but I said it in a, <laughs> in a, uh, in a breakfast. Uh, Lucy uh, uh, from Peanuts Cartoons, she has her hand, she's shaking it and says, I may, may not be right, but I'm loud. <laughs> right, and right. and the, president, the current president of the United States is, is, is all of that. <laughs> yeah. he, he's Lucy, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Do, sorry, I'm, I'm following a track you started that media may be not doing a good job in getting across the way that science operates, but perhaps that's also true of our education generally, that when people go through their science classes in school, they don't come out knowing what science is. They come out thinking that science delivers a set of facts yeah. that can be trusted. Yes, I, I, you know, to actually get science, you actually, you really have to do it at some stage, yeah. I think. I mean, I, there was a very interesting move some years back, and I, I, I suspect, I, I guess Stephen's well on top of this, but this idea of physics first, remember that movement? Did that actually get traction? It was uh, no, it, it, yeah. it hasn't. But, but, but let me go back to yeah. what you said is dead right. Um, what, the way we teach science is, uh, in high school and in college is here's a set of facts. And there are now modern educators are looking at what you know and how what we consider expert thinking, which is, you know, okay, here's some facts. How do you actually do something and, and actually begin to assess evidence, which is what we really want to teach. And after the class, they actually were worse than when they started uh, because they were learned, here's what to memorize. And so we're totally rewriting education in physics, chemistry, especially is to say, no, we want to teach people how to think. Mm -hmm. And so that's the most important thing. And we're, we were going backwards. And so this is a new realization that uh, we were doing it all wrong. It's only when you get to graduate school and postdoc that you begin to teach people how to think again. But boy, most people don't go to graduate school <laughs> and become postdocs. They have to learn this in grade school, high school, and college. Mm. There's something about our education system that actually turns large numbers of people off science, totally. And, and, and you get people who are highly intelligent people, educated in, in the more arts side of things. If they come across anything that's science, for instance, in a book, they will immediately drop it. They will immediately turn off. Mm -hmm. And, and I th that's pretty unfortunate. It's well, given the, yeah. given the transformational power of science on our lives and the fact that we're always having, all having to make science-based decisions all the time, yes. whether it's about climate change or GMOs or whatever, mm -hmm. it's pretty important that we should have some kind of proper grounding in it to enable us to make the right decisions. So right. Yes, it, seems to, it seems a pretty fundamental challenge, a grand challenge for humanity, if you like, to have, a genera to have the next generations come up and be ready for this. Well, the great news is, uh, you know, like the four or five steps to reform or whatever, or sobriety, <laughs> uh, at least we know we were doing it wrong before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's the first step. Uh, and, and we're doing a lot of experiments at Stanford uh, and e everywhere else, I think, to try to say, how do you get, you know, how do you measure how people can actually assess information, I think, and then how do you actually get them to do it? One of the things that we found really powerful is you start to ask questions in class and let them go in a little group of one, two or three for a few minutes and then come back. And that begins to cement a lot of things. And so it's not the professor drones on, they take the notes and everything. You don't need to take the notes. It's all, you can post it and everything else. And getting people engaged in real time is very, very important. Mm. Yes, I suppose that is 
sorry, I keep on finding new tracks to go down, but I suppose the social side of science is so important to get across because, again, I think science is quite often thought of as a rather individualistic activity. It's um, a, yeah, it's a very cooperative activity, basically. I mean, the, 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 uh, a good laboratory is really a, a sort of social, social microcosm, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you've got all these interactions going on, and, uh, and a lot of what we do, because you have to do so many different types of measurements, you'll have a whole bunch of people all coming together on a particular, particular experiment or a particular problem and, and working very closely together on it. So it's, I think, something people miss if they move out of science, is that, is that yeah. sort of collegiality and cooperativity. Mm -hmm. Questions? Now's your chance. Yes, please. Um, there's a microphone which you need, you need to use a microphone so we can hear you, if you see what I mean. I mean, maybe we don't. What's your suggestion for future biomedical or just researchers in raising or increasing truth in research, in science? What's your suggestion for uh, for, uh, for increasing tr for for, uh, for, for uh, I mean for increasing the trust in science for, uh, trust or in truth. science well, truth well, basically working with young biomedical scientists I, 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 which I've been doing sort of for fifty years I I don't think I've ever come across a situation where I th I've thought that anyone's faking anything. Uh, I've done what Steve says. I've had people repeat things, maybe ask the question in a somewhat different way, so it's not pos not so obvious that it's a repeat. I think young scientists, particularly, on a very, a very, very dedicated to this idea of integrity, uh, of the integrity of the science. It's, it's it, it can be a bit corrupted later, I, I suspect. Yeah. And to that, so, I yes, yeah. to that I would would add that. Um, there, the, there's a flowering of new methods of measuring things. Uh, there are physical methods, there are biochemical methods, there are structural methods, all, and so all of these different tools can be used to, have, to actually figure out what's really going on. The reproducibility has to be a standard in every lab, a very high standard of reproducibility, and the willingness to go and test yourself by having, uh, it could be wrong, get a different way of measuring, even a different tool. And that also adds to that. I, I mean, you know, the criticism of climate science where, where people say these people are faking and that sort of thing is just ridiculous because you look at a climate science group, I, I, I'm not my field, but I chaired a, uh, a big research group uh, advisory committee for a time in this area. And basically what you've got is very, very smart people trained principally in, in physics, oceanography, these sorts of areas. These are, are really smart, very dedicated, very professional people. The idea that they could be corrupted to falsehood by some sort of conspiracy of the elders is absolutely absurd. I mean, that simply could not and would not happen. It, it's uh, it just it, totally contrary to the reality of the But system. if you say they're corrupted long enough, people might believe it. <laughs> yeah, uh, people, people <laughs> say it. And so yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question over here, please. Uh, I would like, as a journalist, to continue on the media track. Uh, and uh, I fully agree about what you said that uh, news media today is uh, l its logic is uh, managed by economical fac yes. factors mm -hmm. but sometimes uh, I have a feeling also that journalists are not um, uh, fully um, account their subjects when they interview researchers or, or uh, scientists and have a of, um, some some of uh, over over too much respect for scientists, and also is there a responsibility from the scientist side, uh, whom I, I I think sometimes think journalists are stupid, <laughs> and they can say whatever they like, and it gets published without being criticized or scrutinized. Uh, do you have a comment on that, either of you yes. or both? Well, you know, my, my experience with journalists is particularly being in Australia, which is dominated a bit by Murdoch media, which is problematic. Um, the and and the the very uh, actually a very small number of science journalists. So uh, you would find yourself being questioned about some sort of science issue by by someone who basically reports on football, 
who would always put it in an adversarial <laughs> adversarial mode because that's the way they think about things. So it's very difficult to actually get get something across. I, I sort of we sort of gave up actually on the idea of, of making it work better. So what we did uh, it was an initiative from a, a former newspaper editor who'd come out to Australia. He'd edited the Scotsman and the Observer in the UK. A man called Andrew Jaspin. And he'd come out to edit the Melbourne Age, which is quite a reasonable newspaper, not Murdoch. And, uh, and then they decided to go down market, so he left. But he got this idea of formulating a, a, a new type of media, which is essentially, it's online. But what he did, he said, we'll, we'll tap all the expertise in universities. We'll get people to write 800 word pieces on their, their area of expertise and we'll put that through a professional newsroom of editors and journalists. And, and this led to a, a, a pro production called the, the Conversation, it's one word. And this has been enormously successful. They built in all sorts of things. Firstly, everyone who writes for it makes a conflict of interest statement, which is published with every article. And they have to have some sort of academic affiliation to keep out the, the criminals in the think tanks. I mean, these people are just crooks on the whole. So, uh, so basically, um, uh, that caught on in Australia. We get the articles come out there. You, you simply sign up for it. Uh, it comes to your email inbox every morning, uh, six days a week, and uh, any article that's published in that can be lifted by a newspaper or by any other media outlet as long as they acknowledge where it comes from and republish. So many of the articles are republished, and, and they're very good, authoritative, clearly written and easily understandable articles. This is now driving a lot of media activity in Australia. It's, n it's now running in the United Kingdom. It's, the French took it up. Uh, it's running in Africa. It's running in the United States. So take a look at it. I mean, it's the conversation, one word, dot edu, or something like that. And, and just take a look at it, because it's, it's, it's actually making the, the academic whether it be political science or science or social or anything, part of the communication thing, but not in a way where it's an echo chamber like uh, uh, Facebook or, or yeah. Twitter and so forth. But, Steve. but um, I think um, uh, scientists uh, have the responsibility to communicate what they're doing. And uh, I haven't actually had that reaction with most journalists. Um, it's not adversarial and... Um, uh, there's a genuine attempt to try to learn what we're doing. And, and um, Einstein famously said many famous things, but he said, make simple things as simple as possible, but no more. <laughs> and, and he was a master at reducing things to very simple but absolutely correct statements. And so uh, I think as scientists, that should be the ideal. Uh, and so if a journalist or the public or whatever does not understand what we're doing, it's largely our fault. Uh, and so if scientists have that attitude rather than, uh, you know, I'm so smart and if you don't understand what I'm doing, shame on you, uh, it can go a long way to actually getting a much more receptive audience. Yeah. I was actually more referring by the journalism of finding that one in 10,000 or one in 5,000 that uh, willing to say something where it doesn't represent uh, a, the balanced view of science. And just, just to pick up on something else you said, um, do people respect you too much as scientists or uh, indeed as Nobel laureates? Is that, does that create a barrier to the sort of questions that journalists can ask you? Uh, it's certainly true that after you get a Nobel Prize, something seems to happen. Um, I never really fully understood this until after I got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and it was not only on December 10, in 1997, I'm on stage and I look out and I said, oh my gosh, this is a big deal. And because what I said to myself before that is, I'm no smarter than I was uh, before October. And all the people who got Nobel Prizes before me that I knew didn't get suddenly smarter. <laughs> they, were, they were either smart or stupid before, and they were the same. Uh, and, and so, um, but the public has a different view of that. Mm. And, and so I, um, 
So you try to guard against it and try as hard as you can not to ramble on, uh, but it's <laughs> so tempting. <laughs> you, 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 I mean, you, you do your up, uh, in the science communication space. You you do your utmost to try and tell the story in a way that your audience is going to understand it. And so so it, it's so, sort of a learning curve for most of us because most of us before this for the Nobel Prize we don't spend much time on the public stage. Uh, but but once you're on the public stage, you learn a, a lot of things very quickly. One, one thing is that no matter how uh, crazy a question may seem, and I'm, we're not getting that from this audience, but how crazy it may seem, the last thing you ever do is humiliate the questioner in any way whatsoever. Because as soon as you do that, uh, even if they think the question is crazy too, you lose your audience. You have to try... Uh, the best you can do is say someone comes along and says, I, I don't believe in vaccination. I believe if I feed my child the right way, he'll, he'll have a great immune system. The best you can do is, is try to sow a little seed of doubt just very de- gently. And, and you can't do any better than that. So you do your best, but we're not trained as science communicators. We have to learn it. Okay. I see two more questions. I promise you. Yes, you're, oh, there are lots, but we'll have to move quickly. For shorter answers. We haven't got long. <laughs> So, in Sweden, uh, I'm in high school right now, and in the last year of high school, you, uh, everyone like, makes a project, and uh, a science project, and when I uh, try to search for sources, articles, most articles were pretty expensive for the average person, and like, the only way we could reasonably use them was to find someone that was in a university or something yes. to give them to us and it feels like as l- if you're not inside academia it's really hard to get in to get like well, of course, primary sources of course more and more and more science now is going to open access where the scientist pays ahead of time so i mean publication of an article even even online costs something and the scrutiny, the reviewing, and all the rest of it. So, so in many cases, we're now paying ahead of, of, of publication, basically so that the article will be an open access article. The issue is, though, uh, for many people, I mean, you're no doubt more sophisticated than most, but for many people, if you contact, look at an open access scientific paper, I mean, it's, it's a totally different type of writing. It can be quite incomprehensible, and you can come to quite some quite wrong conclusions mm. if you don't understand how how that process actually works and how the publication process works. But I think uh, we, uh, I, I'm not sure of physics. I don't know, but but I think more and more of of publication moves to open access. Well, well, yeah. first let me make a small correction. The scientists actually pay whether it's open access or not. Page charges. The only the only exceptions would be the for-profit journals um, and, and Nature of Science itself. Mm. But but virtually every other, whether uh, you pay pay charges, you pay extra to mm. get it open access. Right. Uh, what you describe is a serious problem, uh, and so one is trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, yes, these articles could be very technical, but the first step is, uh, you know, how do you give uh, the wider audience this open access. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, the paywall is still a very serious uh, yes. barrier. Yes. Yeah, because although open access is growing, there's still there's an increasing dominance of those um, p- top tier journals that people are trying to get into to get their names made in science, and those are not offering themselves for free in the main. Well, most of them are now open access after a year. Is yeah, that sure. There's well, a, but yeah. that's yes. Yeah. After a year, after sometimes. A year. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But but the other problem is that many of the articles are, are incomprehensible, even if you're in the field. I mean, <laughs> some of them. By the time they're reviewed and re-reviewed and so forth, what may have been a perfectly clear ox- exposition from the original author can end up as something that's simply a, a, a verbal morass. And uh, so what we have is people writing what we call news and views to actually explain what the paper's saying. Quite so. Okay, um, we're running short of time, but there was a question here. I'll take one here, please. Yes? Quick question. Thank you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the online teaching platform, uh, such as Coursera, Mock, and so forth, because it becomes more and more popular uh, nowadays, especially for emerging economies. So uh, can we say it can be a good solution for the delivering the trustable 
uh, knowledge or science to those on, on, places. Online teaching yeah, platforms. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, you know, what, you know, I'm learning chemistry. I actually go to Khan Academy, and they teach me what's redox reduction, you know, reduction oxidation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so proud. Uh, I'm willing to admit that these things are great. Uh, and and they're, they are wonderful. And you know what the sad thing is? A lot of the online courses with the interaction between the student and the machine is actually making a bigger dent in education than the formal lecture. Yep. And so we um, have to up our game as lecturers in universities uh, because it's going to be very good and also gets to be universal education uh, in uh, many places where you don't have... Um, places like Stanford. It's, a, it, it's great. I mean, it's yeah. particularly in a country like Australia, where you know it's a, an enormous country, and people are stuck in country towns. Uh, someone, uh, someone with small children at home, for instance, can access inf information. We have well organised, uh, essentially, uh, distance education for a very long time, and that has moved into this type of area with exactly the type of technology that Stephen's talking about. That uh, uh, basically, it's w initially when people started to do this they found if they had to answer the questions from their students coming back, it was taking all their time. Then they analysed it and they found there were a limited number of questions. They developed essentially machine answers and everyone is perfectly happy with that. And uh, it, it works extremely well. So there are not that many variants, in fact. So. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I've learned a lot from this conversation. I hope you have too. Um, one thing I've learned is that you use Khan Academy, so I'm going straight back to tell my 12-year-old son that if Steve Chu uses it, you can spend 40 minutes on it this evening. Um, uh, thank you to both my panellists and to all of you, audience, for being here. Thank you.